Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum. Very good afternoon, very good evening to everyone. Um, I am Shamil Yusof, uh, representing the Secretariat for VC Sukan Negara 2030. Welcome to today's town hall. Today's uh, town hall is a session number four with the topic of technology and innovation in sports. To start, Allow me to introduce our esteemed panel of speakers today. Uh, so, I would like to start with Dr. Muhammad Hasnun Arif Hassan, the President of Malaysia Sports Technology Association, or MAESTA. Uh, welcome to Mr. Joseph Dolcetti, uh, the CEO of Lila Move Tech. Mr. Raymond Hung, CEO of Athletes for Athletes Solutions in Yamarhat, or AFA. Inji Azmir Z, the CEO of ATF Sport TV. And Mr. Shi Yong Tan, the CEO of BIIB Application or New Pulse Sunya Merhat. Uh, let's give them a rousing welcome. Um, again, I am Shamil Yusof. Uh, we are representing Ministry of Youth and Sport, KBS. Uh, we are now embarking on a 10 year on on producing a 10 year blueprint and roadmap for the country for sports in the country called Visi Sukan Negara, and. Um, I understand that many of you have been following the town hall series for Visi Sukan Negara and for that we thank you, we thank you very much. And uh, there will be multiple and various other sessions uh, to follow up this one, focusing on all the pillars of uh, Visi Sukan Negara. So for today, without further ado, I'd like to uh, jump into the introduction to Visi Sukan Negara, which we will then play you a short video explaining what exactly is the national sports vision. So if we may start with the slides. Okay, next. A little bit of a brief introduction. Uh, the Malaysian Ministry of Youth and Sports, we are in the midst of developing a national sports vision, uh, a roadmap and blueprint that will hopefully drive the nation's sporting future for the next 10 years through the empowerment of industry-related policies for us to be able to develop a vibrant sports industry that is comprehensive, integrated and collective. Next. The rationales behind uh, the production or the formulation of this uh, national sports vision is number one, to position Malaysia as a leader in the global sporting landscape, reinforced by a sustainable sports industry. Number two, we are fully committed to the aspirations and principles of the Shared Prosperity Vision 2030 or Wawasan Kemakmuran Bersama. Number three, we are committed to advancing the Agenda 2030 of the United Nations Sustainable Developmental Goals. Number four, to leverage on the rapidly evolving application of technology in the changing dig digital world. And number five, to have a democratization of sports in Malaysia by focusing on emerging new sports. Next. So what exactly is VC Sukan Negara? Um, VSN is a sports development planning structure for a period of 10 years in line with the Shared Prosperity Vision. It is a development of a collective, inclusive and comprehensive sports development, development plan with the concept of from the community to the community. Number three, we aim of making Malaysia an agile sporting nation with a mission to cultivate sports as a catalyst to improve socio-economy and quality of life. And number four, we aspire that the document will outline key trusts new focuses and high impact approaches for us to empower the national sports development agenda with a clear outcome and action plan. Next. Uh, we have ascertained six focus areas, uh, which we will cover sparingly today. Uh, the first focus areas is sporting culture, where we seek to promote sports culture as a lifestyle for all Malaysians. Number two is sporting excellence, where we want to continue the prolonged efforts of uh, establishing a high-performance sports ecosystem that is active in nurturing champions on the global stage. Number three, for talent development and identification, we want to identify, nurture and empower future talents through a structured and comprehensive national talent development model that will be driven by innovative scientific applications. Number four, to create Malaysia as a sporting hub 
to position Malaysia not just as a preferred destination for world-class sports services and infrastructure, but also facilities, coaching and other professional sports services. We can't underline enough the importance of professional sports services. You know, we have a lack of sports lawyers, we have a lack of sports nutritionists, sports psychologists, media consultants and so on and so forth. Number five is sports industry empowerment, where we seek to empower a progressive and high-value-added sporting industry that will significantly contribute to the national economy. And last but not least, we want to cultivate a healthy environment for professionalism in sports, where we enhance professionalism in the national sports ecosystem by focusing on high-integrity and effective governance. Next. So having ascertained all of those pillars, uh, we understood that we needed to start our journey by engaging everyone, engaging all of the stakeholders in sports. So we started off with the VSN 2030 Canvas. What is this Canvas? It is an initiative by KBS for us to acquire and gather aspirations and hopes from all Malaysians, from all layers of life and stakeholding in the sporting industry and beyond in guiding the government in, to formulate the direction of the nation's new sports development plan more collectively towards empowering a progressive and sustainable sports industry. To cut across all the jargon, ladies and gentlemen, KBS seeks to listen to all of you. We want to listen to your feedbacks. We want to listen to your inputs. We want to listen to your complaints and hopefully the constructive criticism for us to, number one, be able to understand you better. Number two, be able to un internalize our processes with all the stakeholders in mind. And number three, to produce a roadmap and blueprint that everyone will own together. Next. The component of the canvas includes the VSN 2030 Canvas portal. Uh, you can visit vsn2030.my where it's an interactive online portal for citizens to voice your views and aspirations. And number two, uh, since August last year, we have been uh, doing a lot of uh, internal town hall sessions with all of the stakeholders, associations, athletes, coaches, management involved in the Malaysian sports landscape. But now from um, April to October onwards, we will be conducting multiple various engagement sessions, more than 60 engagement sessions, um, where we will uh, engage uh, the audience via town halls, uh, clubhouse, Twitter space sessions, and uh, FB live sessions. Next. The timeline for Canvas VC Sukarnagara, it was launched on the 7th of April, 2021, and it will, it will conclude in October. Right now, we are in the data collection and engagement of stakeholders uh, sector, and we are going to move into the development of the initial document within July and August. So we, after we speak to all of you, we will be also be holding a few workshops where we will, we will have challenge sessions and consult multiple panels from the academy as well as the professional sectors uh, to be able to understand uh, the formulation of the blueprints of the sectors within the blueprints. So we seek to, or we aim to publish the National Sports Vision document from October onwards. Next. Please don't hesitate to share your vision. Uh, you can scan the QR code on the screen, which will take you to vsn2030.my, our portal. Uh, share your vision, share your aspirations. Uh, we want to hear from you. We want to understand what is close to your heart and how we can together more effectively, effectively bring Malaysian sports to the, into the future. So without further ado, I'd like to continue with a special video for VSN2030. Bagi saya, kita perlu ada visi untuk menjadikan atlet-atlet kita bertaraf antarabangsa. Aspirasi saya adalah untuk meningkatkan prestasi atlet di persada dunia untuk melahirkan lebih ramai lagi jago dunia. Supaya jurulatih-jurulatih tempatan diberi lebih peluang dapat uh, juga menguruskan uh, semua bidang sukan. Aspirasi saya adalah untuk uh, membantu Malaysia menjadi lebih kompetitif uh, dari uh, segi e-sports uh, in the international level. Lah. Aspirasi saya ialah untuk melihat atlet-atlet negara yang berada di kemuncak prestasi mereka selepas mereka bersara terus menjadi wira di mata rakyat Malaysia.
mengharapkan dan juga mengimpikan banyak lebih ramai uh, atlet Paralimpik yang berkualiti tinggi dapat dihasilkan uh, My Bakat iaitu Talent Identification Plan untuk Malaysia akan menjadi satu penyelesaian kepada kesinambungan atlet-atlet yang bakal menyumbang kepada dekad emas Visi saya ialah uh, lebih kepada membudayakan sukan Sekarang kita dapat melihat semakin ramai yang minat dengan sukan basikal Tetapi mungkin antara penghalangnya dari segi uh, facilities Dari segi uh, peluang uh, yang diberikan yang lebih jelas Untuk kepada yang berminat untuk nak bergiat dengan sukan berbasikal Mereka lebih faham dan lebih ada keterbukaan Aspirasi saya adalah menjadikan semua atlet dari Malaysia untuk menjadi hero untuk semua rakyat, rakyat Malaysia dengan menggunakan digital so, macam social media, Facebook, TikTok, segala platform dia supaya boleh membinakan inspirasi untuk semua orang. Quality for athletes, variety of talents. Addictivity to the minds, grace and style of Malaysian athletes. We are legends, we have stories to be told. Well, hi, I'm Nicole David and my national sport vision would be to have uh, more children in schools to play sport and be active and also to have families to get involved as well. Saya berharap Visi Sukan Negara 2030 melalui strategi-strategi yang, yang lebih bersepadu akan dapat memperkasakan lagi pembangunan sukan di Malaysia dan seterusnya melahirkan jago-jago negara berkelas dunia. Saya mengharapkan visi sukan negara kita mempunyai begitu banyak badan-badan dan juga persatuan sukan yang bertaraf antarabangsa dan juga atlet-atlet kita mencapai ataupun memiliki pencapaian pingat emas dalam sukan olimpik dan di semua kejohanan-kejohanan dunia. Ini adalah visi saya. Apakah visi anda? Ini visi saya. Apakah visi anda? Ini visi saya. Visi anda bagaimana pula? This is my vision. What about yours? Itu visi saya, visi anda pula bagaimana? Ini visi saya, anda bagaimana pula? Inilah inspirasi dan inilah visi saya dan apakah visi anda? Okay, thank you, thank you to the Secretariat for such an inspirational video. I've watched it many times. I want to share my visions. Um, all right. Uh, so thank you for being with us today. Uh, I'd like to say hello again to everyone. Uh, so right now is the moment we've all been waiting for. Uh, this is when we get to speak to our panelists, uh, to our speakers one by one. So um, again, the house rules for anyone who has uh, questions for the panelists, please don't hesitate to put up the questions at the Q&A section. Uh, we will address them from time to time. Um, there will be a poll in the middle of the session. Uh, feel free to answer the poll at your own convenience. And finally, for those who want to uh, relay your questions yourself, uh, don't hesitate to press the raise hand uh, button, which we will bring you up to speak later. Okay. So to begin, let me introduce to everyone to Dr. Muhammad Hasnun Arif Hassan, who is the president of Malaysia Sports Technology Association or MISTA. Uh, how are you, Dr. Swaikom? Assalamualaikum. Fine, thank you, Shamil. So we're very happy to have you here today, Doctor. So thank you too for inviting me. Our pleasure, our pleasure. So why not you start with introducing yourself and your association, and perhaps uh, then you, we could speak later on the topics of the day. Okay. So how long do I have to introduce myself and the for all the speakers? Okay. We would appreciate about three to five minutes per speaker to introduce right. uh, ourselves. Then later, kita boleh jump into all the topics. Okay, so uh, Assalamualaikum and uh, very good afternoon to all the participants of this webinar. So my name is uh, Muhammad Hasnun Arif bin Hassan. I'm currently working as a lecturer at the University of Malaysia Pahang. And uh, I am uh, here representing the Malaysia Sports Technology Association. This is a new uh, association or we call it MyStar. Uh, we have uh, been officially approved by the uh, ROS last year and uh, on the 11th of November 2020. So it's we are about seven months old uh, now. So I think uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, my star. How did, uh, how did my star actually started? So actually back in 2014, we've already planned to establish a society uh, during a conference. At that time, uh, there, is a, there was a conference uh, called Movement Health and Exercise Conference, MOHE Conference, 
2014 in Kuantan. So this was the time I met uh, several key people uh, such as uh, Mr. Said Faris from ISN. Uh, and also I met Dr. Muhammad Noor from UTM and other researchers working in the field of sports engineering and technology. So we also had a representative from the International Sports Engineering Association, uh, Professor Veit Sainer from the Technical University of Munich, present at the conference. Uh, he represented the ISEA, the International Sports Engineering Association. And uh, at that time, he suggested that we became the, the ISEA chapter Malaysia. But uh, unfor unfortunately, uh, the, the, the plan was not further pursued. Uh, and um, but the 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 ground uh, the foundation was laid uh, and the idea uh, was uh, has been discussed uh, since 2014, and in 2019, uh, a few guys uh, from uh, UMP University Malaysia Pahang, uh, Dr Anwar and myself uh, from from UniMap, uh, Mr Suhizas from UITM, we have Dr Zulkifli and Mr Shuhada from UTM, Dr. Muhammad Noor, and UTHM, Dr. Zamani, and from ISN also, uh, Mr. Said Faris and Mr. Fauzi, we sat together over coffee and kuih and decided uh, to form uh, this association related to sports technology in Malaysia, and we call it uh, Malaysia Sports Technology Association, MyStar. So uh, if I can talk about the aim of MyStar, uh, MyStar aims to be the bridge between the academia and industry. And we believe in develop, developing sports technology products, uh, the first thing to, to have is we, we need the problem. So this is where uh, government institutions such as uh, ISN, for example, identifies the problem experienced by the athletes or the coach. Uh, because the uh, academia on our side, we, we do not have direct access to the athletes. And then... Uh, Stage two in designing a product uh, is to design and testing. So this is where uh, academia comes into, uh, into play, uh, where our role is to design, simulate, calculate, do the test in the lab. These are all the things that we can do uh, at the university. And then uh, after uh, a prototype has been produced, we need to test it in the field. So this is where uh, a sports council or ISN again comes into the equation to, to test the products uh, in, in the field on actual athletes. And once the prototype is finished, uh, normally it has reached uh, technology, technology readiness level six, for example. Most of the time, it is not yet marketable because that is not uh, a thing that uh, academia is good at, designing products to be marketable. We, we just propose the technology or integrate the technology. So this is where I think industry comes into play uh, to, to, to make the products uh, marketable. So And then finally... Uh, industry uh, will then market the product. So I think this ecosystem of uh, sports uh, technology product development requires the involvement of many parties. So there should be a platform where these people from different backgrounds can sit together, discuss on potential projects and collaborate. So this is what MyStar is aiming uh, to become. So I think uh, that is my uh, sh uh, brief introduction about myself and MyStar. Uh, thank you, Shamil. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Doc. Very interesting to hear. Um, I think it's integral for everyone to know uh, that MyStar is an or would be an, an enabler for uh, all of us interested in developing uh, probably technologies or businesses in sports. Is that correct, Doc? Yes, correct. That, that is what we are hoping for. And then we hope that we can be the, the hub uh, to, to connect uh, these uh, people from various backgrounds, like I mentioned earlier, yeah. That's great. So to all the attendees today, you can reach out to Dr. Hasnun and also the, all the other speakers via the Q&A section. Uh, you can ask questions or you can ask for his phone number and email also for you to talk later. So uh, this is a session that uh, wants to promote and connect every one of you uh, from the industry to the relevant parties and people who may be able to help uh, collate and collaborate uh, to work something better for everyone. Okay. So, uh, for our next speaker, I'd like to introduce Mr. Joseph Dolcetti, the CEO of Lila Move Tech. How are you, Joseph? Uh, can you unmute your mic, please, Joseph? Sorry, I'm good. I'm well. Thank you so much for having me today. It's great to be here with all these uh, wonderful experts in the area. It's our pleasure. So why don't you introduce yourself for the benefit of everyone and uh, maybe a slight introduction to what you do? 
Okay, well, uh, as I said, I'm Joe. I'm originally from Canada, and I've been involved in the sports environment here in Malaysia since I got here. I was originally head of high performance training for National Sports Council, National Sports Institute of Malaysia, back from 2000 Olympics. So I came in under ISN on a two year project with uh, Sydney Olympics and Sea Games 2001, and two years became four, six, eight, and I was with Sports Council and I think was fairly instrumental in helping to develop a lot of the national um, high performance program that we were still running today. And uh, a lot of the top staff and people around there were people that were there brought in and trained with me. And I, I left Sports Council in 2009 after sort of Beijing. And I started um, and I started working on my own technology as Doc was talking about I created and prototype a new tech in something called wearable resistance. We started, I started that in 2003 and exactly like that, you know, making literally making prototypes myself, testing ideas out, putting them on people like Lee Chong Wei and Sean Han and Malaysian badminton and various athletes in the early days. In fact, our first prototypes we were testing already as of the Athens Olympics 2004. And Nazmi Zen, our 100 meter, 200 meter sprint king from way back in the early 2000s, was a was a key person that was a part of the whole inspiration and in getting the idea out uh, because it was a speed product. And by 2009, the product had been sort of really cleaned up a lot. It's still just me working by myself mostly and a few friends. And by then, uh, we had enough feedback from the market that people were saying. You should take something with this technology and develop it commercially. You know, Doc, you were talking about the difficulty in commercializing ideas. Uh, I can tell you what that's like from start to finish, and not only um, not only commercializing but patenting and the whole process, because it's one thing to bring tech in; it's another thing to create a new tech. And so, as of 2009, 2010, we formed uh, Sport Pole Sindirian Brahad, which is the parent company that brings the Leela movement technology branded products and wearable tech out to the market. And now literally just today, we're launching uh, our USA and UK teams this month. We've got, and we work with everybody from the New Zealand All Blacks to Paris Saint Germain, Steph Curry and the Golden State Warriors, Canelo Alvarez. I mean, it's pretty exciting to see this little product that started out here in Malaysia now really making an impact at the global level. and. And the next challenge though, um, it's wonderful to have tech accepted in a marketplace by tech people, but it's a whole different ball game creating a commercial success. And I think everybody on this panel can talk about the difference between great ideas and great people and great thoughts and movement and, and great companies. And you know, we're in that stage now trying to develop a great company out of it. And we're hoping, um, we're hoping to get there and we're certainly going to work forward towards it. And I'm just excited to be here. And, and if I, I could share any of this experience with anybody, you know, I'm more than happy to do that. Malaysia is my home. And I started the company here because in Canada, there's a lot of tech, you know, the U S there's a lot of great tech. So when I had the choice to start the company, I took a good long look at the Malaysian sport environment. And I, and I thought, to be honest, it was the bigger challenge. Malaysia doesn't have any tech. You know, there's no sports technology back then coming from Malaysia. We were bringing stuff in. And I thought, you know, I, I thought, you know, Malaysia needs examples of leadership in this area. So my local partners and I, we, we decided to uh, see if we can make this happen from here. And it's certainly a challenge doing that, but I wouldn't have done it any other way. And as you know, Cradle and Ministry of Finance and a lot of these other great organizations some people here, Shay Ong and the others are also were part of the Cradle Ministry of Finance community. And the other reason why I stayed here, and I think even a credit to Vision 2030, there's really great support in Malaysia for a lot of these new initiatives. And I think everybody here also would feel that. And so I, I you know, I looked at what was happening in places like Canada back home, and I just thought the environment was better here to get great support. And and I and I still think that's that way. Now we have to get out and get to the big markets overseas, but but that's a different challenge. And um, again, I'm really happy to be here. And that guy in the red shirt, I'm really happy to see him because uh, him and I are rugby teammates from the NS Wanderers. He was um, many years ago, he was a little bit slower than me back then, but um, yeah, I think his business is doing better now though. Little, little bit slower, I'll, I'll yeah. think. 
he was pretty quick, not bad, but it's good to see him in all the faces and, and from the video. But that's our story. Like I said, in our tech line is specifically in wearable tech, wearable resistance and uh, metric solutions to measure change in performance. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, I just like to touch on one small point. Um, it makes me infinitely proud uh, and also happy that you chose Malaysia as the home uh, for you, you know, for your test bed, for you to launch your product as well as your company. And uh, it's also very heartening uh, to hear you say that the ecosystem in Malaysia has assisted you somewhat uh, for you to be able to bring this product to the global stage. And I'm sure most of the efforts are yours and your teams alone. However, the the kind of support, uh, the nature and nurture system that you went through, that is exactly the system that KBS seeks to fine tune mm. and uh, to make more effective for everyone else who goes through the journey. Into yeah, and, and a point on that, you know, we're just in the process of signing an MOU with ISN who was, you know, ISN and I are, are family. So we're working with Faisal and the team then on making sure that we're home strong and the product is is getting out to the Malaysian athletes and sports system and community as well. But yeah, I, I, you know, I'm really proud of that too. Malaysia has always had a great support for us and everybody likes to complain about what's going on at home, but we forget all the great things that are happening here too. And I think this is part of that. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's good for us to point out that the National Sports Institute, Institute Sukanagara, um, is playing the role as catalyst, enabler, and aggregator for sports technology and innovation in sports. So, thank you again, Joseph. Uh, let's move to the next speaker for you to be able to introduce yourself. Uh, next, we have uh, my brother, Raymond Hung, uh, the CEO of Athletes for Athlete Solutions, Yamrahat Afa. Uh, Raymond, how are you, bro? Hey, man. How are you? Good, how good, good. You introduce yourself and your business. Yeah, sure. So hi everyone. So my name is Raymond. I'm the co-founder of uh, Athletes for Athletes, or we call it AFA, APA. So we are the mobile technology company that is, um, we consider ourselves ambitious and passionate about building a platform that basically connects the ecosystem with the sports industry for athletes and sports enthusiasts of all levels to the venues, the facilities, merchants, and other businesses. But in the layman term, we basically create a mobile application and a digital uh, software that connects people with sports. So we believe that uh, the sports ecosystem itself is built based on different pillars, right? So there are a lot of uh, potential that it is AFA's mission to connect all of these pillars together. So uh, what we do specifically uh, in our mobile uh, technology company is that primarily uh, we offer venue booking platform. So what we do here is basically we facilitate venue bookings through uh, our AFA mobile application platform for both the users and also the venue operators. On the other hand, we are, um, we are also in the effort of uh, building our very own uh, IoT technology that basically um, helps venue operators in moving towards um, automation. And one main thing we do under EFA Link, which is the IoT technology, uh, is basically enabling users to basically book a venue. Example, if you play badminton, uh, want to play badminton, right? You have a badminton court to be able to, you're basically able to activate the court lights simply by just scanning a QR code once you book the venue with AFA app, right? So it, um, what we plan to do here is basically uh, to position it as a fully contactless tech. And this is basically um, what we plan to make it as the go-to solution as an initiative for all venues as uh, one step for the post-pandemic plans. So the future of AFA basically is to link, uh, link up with more businesses uh, like products and services to the users leveraging on our mobile technology because um, our platform basically comprises of the users that are mainly into sports, right? So that's our goal. So our vision is basically to be the pioneering mobile application uh, company that connects and is used by as many users as possible of athletes, sports enthusiasts, and also like the businesses of uh, the ecosystem of sports. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, bro. A few questions I have for you. Um, yeah. So your app is actually up and running. Uh, can I can we download it? Oh can yes, yes. Uh, except if you're using Huawei, uh, you can basically download our app in Play Store or App Store. Yeah. So to any of our attendees, uh, yang pakai Huawei itu, sorry eh. <laughs> so, yeah, unfortunately, so, uh, not yet. Move on to the next speaker, Raymond. 
could you tell us perhaps uh, where uh, is your app operating out of in terms of sports facilities? Let's say if I come on board, uh, mana I boleh book using your app? Ah, basically, uh, as long as you are in Malaysia, let's say if you are a sports venue owners, you can just uh, contact us. We basically have a separate platform that actually connects the venue operators to manage your bookings. You have a full fledge of a uh, booking scheduler, uh, staff management, sales performance management, and stuff like that. And we are also moving towards our AFA shop, which uh, over there you can sell any of your sports-related items directly to the users of our app. And as for the users, basically, uh, just log on to our app. Basically, you are able to identify your location and you are able to spot any of the nearest uh, sports venues to you. And basically, you can just book a venue directly over there. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, thank you. So, for everyone, uh, do visit the Apple Store, Apple iOS Store and Google Play to download Raymond's app. It's called AFA, AFA, yeah, Raymond? Yes. Okay, so please go download their app and I will get a 15% commission. <laughs> All right, joking, yeah? Okay, uh, okay. next speaker, um, it is my pleasure to invite Encik Azmir Z, the CEO of ATF Sport Taping, also known as Coach Azmi. Uh, someone, before I start, uh, allow him to start. Uh, I used to respect a lot, but now that I found out he's slower than Joseph on the pitch. I'm then- fast. <laughs> so <laughs> go ahead introduce yourself as me all right thank you Shamil for having me hope everyone is fine and staying safe at home okay uh as me here uh I used to play for the national team rugby and I used to play with Joe as well back then I think 2010 2011 at that time uh yeah he was a bit faster but it was all in his dream no yeah, I wasn't yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but not, 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 nonetheless <laughs> not, <laughs> Nonetheless, it was a good time uh, for us to play back then. Um, yeah, I have a background in uh, chemical engineering, work as a ninja for a few years before I decided to start my own business. And as an athlete, uh, I used to get injury a lot. And uh, my worst injury was uh, dislocated my ankle. So uh, back then, I realized that Malaysian haven't got any real product uh, coming from us in this market. That's where the idea popped up. And after doing some research, we decided uh, with my partner to venture into this and started our brand. And that's how ATF was born. So the idea was to be a uh, market leader in recovery and performance. And uh, we started off with uh, one of our products with a rigid tape. But eventually, we um, ev- uh, evolved and started bringing new products. Uh, as compared to all the other established speakers, we might not... Uh, into that tech that much but I uh, mean uh, we try to innovate ourselves and uh, we have a new product in line working with ISN uh, focusing on a recovery uh, but uh, it's not nothing new technology we're just using whatever technology available in the market at the moment and try to enhance things one at a time but of course uh, in the future as we grow our plan is to you know to build our own product and probably work with Dr. Hassan team uh, have a Malaysian grown product and then uh, and build and commercialize it from uh, scratch like what I did uh, by Joseph. I think that's pretty much us. Uh, I think we have grown for the past five years working with all athletes uh, from amateurs all the way to professional athletes and now working with ISN. So it's been a pleasure and hopefully we can be uh, there and not only in Malaysia but make Malaysian proud in the international level as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jasmine, for the introduction. So, um, I'd like to also ask you a few questions. For ATF Spot Tipping, I am also a user of your product. Um, so yes, sir. I'd like to thank you for your the fair price point as well as the quality and uh, you know uh, value entry point for your product. Mm-hmm. However, um, I'd like to ask you, uh, I was very intrigued by your partnerships with Slangor FC, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. with this. And those, those, I feel, are areas which other brands in Malaysia, other products and services should look uh, seriously into in terms of collaboration, mm. also strategic yeah. uh, value proposition between brands and teams. What yeah. have you got to say about that? All right. Okay. So when we started, we knew where we want to be. So I think we just have to find a, a strategy and the, the mechanism on how to get there. So we realized that uh, if we want to go big, we have to be associated with uh, 
reputable association and brands as well. Because uh, starting small, no one's going to look at you. But you, if you are associated with someone is already there and established, people will start looking at you. That's so. That's what that's what our strategy was. I think uh, Joe can satisfy to that, and that's why how why is he's working with the All Blacks and working all institute. You know, because especially when you are a new tech and new company working from Malaysia, I mean, you need to be known and to put. Uh, yourself in the market. I mean, especially with the big guy, will give you some credential. Okay. Uh, before I move on to Shiyong, I got one more question for you, Azmi. Sorry. Yes. Uh, um, sure. What? Honestly, answer honestly. What has been the role of the government, uh, but more more specifically, ISN, the National Sports Institute, in bringing your product or partnering uh, partnering up with you in launching your product to the market? And okay. Increase- and what? Once again. Increasing its success as well, if if applicable. Okay, of course. Um, ISN is a reputable institute, and I mean, people look up to them, especially all the sport association and all the other uh, physio center or, or like. So when you are associated and you got somehow an endorsement from this kind of reputable association, they give you a chance to pitch your product to other association as well, and I like. For example, why are we, uh, for a girl's example, why are they using uh, makeup when endorsed by a celebrity? So that's what we're trying to see. So of course, as a brand, you have to have a good product as well. But with uh, this association endorsement, you get a leapfrog to go to a greater height. So as far as with um, association with uh, FAS and as well as the AISN, we get a better chance to be up there and more trust from our consumer. But I mean, but with the COVID right now, our business is quite affected. But nonetheless, we hope that once the uh, COVID is settled, we'll be right back where we are projecting on our business. Thank you. Thank you, Jasmine. Uh, I'd like to also point out that for everyone in this session, please don't hesitate to contact uh, Institute Skanegara. Uh, you can contact them via the various teams called ISN Niaga, ISN Tech, and ISN Edu. Uh, they have an open door policy to come and listen to uh, view whether you're a budding athlete, whether you're a social sportsman, whether you want to start a business in uh, sports, uh, whether you're an academic who has an interest in the technology within sports, please come to ISN, speak to us. We have uh, commercialization grants, we have incubation and acceleration programs, and we look forward to engaging with everyone from the ecosystem. Shamil, if I may add, I think, uh, if I may add, I think to all new businesses, especially SME, if you have any great idea or any good product, uh, I think ISN have a very open door policy, what Shaman said. You just have to approach them and present your case. That will be a beneficial for both parties. And uh, I think, inshallah, if your product is good enough, they will open their eyes and give you the opportunity to explore of any kind of sign of collaboration. And that's what happened for us. Thank you, ISN. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for that, bro. Thank you for that. Okay. Now for our... Last but not least, uh, our next speaker is Mr. Shiyong Tan, uh, who is the CEO of BIIB and New Pulse in Amarat. How are you, Shiyong? Hi, Shamil. I'm good. Hey, bro. How are you? So, uh, tell us a bit about yourself and your organization. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, first of all, thanks a lot for having me today. I'm glad to meet uh, many of you. And I think some of you is actually my first time meeting. But I hope like after the pandemic, we can have a chance to sit down for some, I don't know, data rate, copy, you know, to chit chat about sports and technology. So, yeah, um, a little bit of uh, background about myself. I think sports have um, somehow shaped me in many ways. So back in like primary school, I was uh, more towards like a track and field athlete for schools. And then, then you know, venture into basketball in high school, participate in the local league and things like that. Then uh, in the later stage of my life, I... Um, I mean, I'm not the old, but <laughs> so I um, actually you know, started to run uh, distance running. So like uh, group races and marathon, um, which I've, I've done more than like 13 years. Um, yeah, more than 30, 13 years, but still very slow. <laughs> so we believe uh, sports is a, it's a very powerful platform to connect different um, communities. And by, by focusing on um, connecting grassroots and communities, we can actually create a large movement among the people and promote, of course, not only just sports or how do you play, how do you excel, but also 
uh, the social integration parts, especially among Malaysian, we have you know different people, different groups, different um, um, you know people from different backgrounds. So I think sports is a is a best tool to actually connect um, Rakyat Malaysia together. Of course, that is not all. We can even uh, bridge people from Malaysia to the world and the world to Malaysia as well. So uh, as I mean, as a co-founder and CEO of BIP, we are a sports technology company that focusing on community building. We create um, gamify challenges for runners and transform running into a team sports. So um, we launched in Malaysia back in 2017. And last year, we launched in Taiwan. And early this year, we actually launched in Singapore. So now we are in three countries. And we are also the owner of the largest a running team challenge in Malaysia for three years in a row. So hopefully this year we can be the largest as well. Uh, we just launched it or pre-launched it uh, last Friday. And yeah, we're seeing uh, more participants joining in and hopefully this year will be a great one to connect more communities in Malaysia. So um, yeah, I personally very interested in sports and technology. First of all, because I enjoy sports uh, since young. And then the other part is uh, by profession, I'm an engineer. So I actually created things, uh, I mean, design engineer in specific. So I actually design items, design electronics. So that makes me like thinking how I can connect or, you know, uh, converge these two parts of my interest into something I like to do. And yeah, so it somehow after so many years, it, I landed in my so-called sweet spots. I can enjoy sports and I can enjoy building things and yeah, creating some impact in Malaysia and even uh, in the international levels. Yeah. Impressive, impressive. You mentioned uh, what I noticed most about your introduction was you mentioned that you've uh, launched into regional markets, namely Taiwan and Singapore. Yes. That is super impressive. That is something that uh, we aspire for all of the businesses and and you know our within our ecosystem to be able to move uh, firstly to our neighboring countries. Uh, I also just like to share that uh, for most of the businesses, we find a synergy in our neighboring countries, especially in Indonesian markets and Singaporean markets, because of uh, we are the same in terms of consumption uh, structure and values. So thank you, Shayong. Um, could you just share with us a bit, possibly, on the numbers of usage? Because when you speak about being one of the largest, you own the largest uh, uh, mass participation, or rather, uh, is it online running group or re- online running activity? Could you share us a bit more detail on that? Sounds sure. Like- yeah. So uh, we are, we are actually the creator of these new types of running challenges. So you know, running is always very individualistic. Uh, regardless of all the f- platforms, facilities, or tools, or mobile apps, GPS watches, they all measure uh, your performance as an individual thing. So what we do here is completely transform all this into a team-based kind of um, game. So if you imagine, we're basically creating new games for running. So instead of you become the fastest, we actually make you be part of the team. So everybody need to work together together uh, to achieve something bigger than themselves. So I think that is uh, something we really love to do because, uh, you know, one people who are good, they can inspire many others to join them. I think that is something we really want to create in Malaysia, especially uh, since we want to promote sports, we want to make Malaysia a sporting nation. Participation is a must. We need to start from the grassroots. And what we do is, like, like uh, what I shared just now, we create a nationwide challenges that allows all the grassroots communities to form teams and take up this national challenge in our platforms. So we can see running clubs coming from different areas in Malaysia. Um, not only in Klang Valley, you can see Penang, Johor, you know, East Coast, even Sabah, Sarawak, they are joining. And some of them, not just a pure running clubs, some of them representing alumni group, some ex-school students, um, corporates. So we can see all sorts of groups communities joining in and you know for us that is really uh, I mean we are happy to see the result because why um, by having that meaning to say by having these type of challenges all these people they are influencing people around them 
to actually participate more. So I think that that is uh, something that keeps us going. We really enjoy doing that. Excellent, excellent. Thank you for that. Um, uh, before we move along, I have another question for you, Shayong. In terms sure. of, uh, you know, we are in the midst of being in a very strange time. We live in a very strange era, right? So what is the major difference uh, in your eyes, in your perspective, between the Malaysians and the Taiwanese and the Singapore in terms of outlook, in terms of acceptance levels of both digital products as well as health and wellness products like the ones you offer? Okay, yeah. So it's actually quite interesting to see the difference between different countries or different regions. So for example, uh, let's take Malaysia uh, compared to Taiwan. So Taiwan is actually a, a region or a place whereby we can see super high sports participations among their residents. So um, compared to Malaysia, I think they are nearly 90% of people actually enjoying sports. Malaysia, I think is quite low, like lower than 20 or 10, I don't know, 20 or a percent. So um, of course the perceptions is quite different. Um, they have slightly more advanced in terms of uh, the existing structures of sports. But Malaysia is actually very unique. If you look at Malaysia, right, we actually have world-class sport, you know, sporting facilities, uh, world-class athletes and things like that. But sometimes uh, we found that the grassroots level is not really connected uh, to the pro sports kind of uh, environment. But you know, that also gives us some uh, very interesting perspective whereby the so-called non-professional or grassroots level, they are more acceptance to new things. Um, but if you look at like Taiwan, they will look at, oh, this thing is not like how pro sports is doing. Then they will, you know, they're a bit reluctant to accept. But in Malaysia, we, we're basically more open to new ideas. And we feel that um, we really, I don't know, because we, we feel that uh, Malaysians are very supportive in terms of you know, accepting new ideas and try them out before they actually judge it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, bro. That's true. That's true. We do have a very accepting culture, uh, but we also have a very, uh, you know, judgmental culture uh, when things <laughs> go wrong. However, there's a Malaysian way. So let's all try to embrace it and uh, work together for this. So, okay. Uh, to reset back the room, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to Town Hall Number Four, uh, Liba Uro session uh, for uh, the National Sports Vision 2030. Uh, today's session is we are speaking to a really fun and uh, you know powerful uh, lineup of speakers. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Hasnon uh, from uh, Maista. We have Mr. Joseph from uh, Lila, Lila Muftek. Uh, Raymond uh, from AFA, Azmir from ETF Sport Taping, and uh, we just had Shayong speaking to us from BIIB and New Pulse. Okay, guys, um, before we move, let's look at the Q&A section uh, for some questions. Okay, uh, first question to be covered for today is from Mr. Andy Chin. So, Andy, you're asking um, any AI, artificial intelligence tech for statistical or data applications available in Data Sukan and ISN that you can leverage for different genres of sports? Uh, good question, Andy. Um, uh, National Sports Institute, uh, under the ISN Tech uh, Unit, as well as Data Sukan, is jointly developing an, a platform. We don't like to call it an application. It is a platform. It is a digital asset. And it is an application as well. It is a website altogether rolled into one uh, called Agile Mass. So Agile Mass is a uh, solution that aims to unify uh, data, uh, technological advancements, as well as uh, the rudimentary users within the sports. So, for example, what is Agile Mass? It is... a uh, a ledger for data. It is a neural. Uh, it is the combination of a neural network to understand what the data is saying to you. And finally, for the users to be able to harness their own data and other people's data to, to make more meaningful uh, participation within sports. So, for example, uh, we will uh, basically be producing also a smartphone app, which you can integrate, hopefully, with other your running apps, your cycling apps, to be able to uh, produce a local leaderboard of usage. 
And uh, within that app as well, uh, we will have uh, other components, hopefully uh, from AFA, uh, the facilities management components uh, for uh, digitalization of the facilities management structures, uh, as well as other features. So yes, Andy, I hope that uh, answers your question. Uh, we are still developing it, but we would love uh, feedback and also involvement uh, for uh, from everyone in the ecosystem. Okay. So let us go back to the topics at hand. Uh, later, we will be sharing with you guys a poll. So we hope that everyone will be able to answer the poll at your convenience. But before we do that, let's talk to Dr. Hasanon again. Uh, Doc, as we all know, sports is a globally transforming industry. Yeah? Dalam rangkuman, dalam daripada segi perspektif uh, COVID-19 punya pandemic ni, pasca pandemic, our industry will be poised to really garner innovation, really garner the time lost, you know. Prior to the pandemic, we were about a decade back on uh, technologies and also application of uh, best practices dalam sport. Dog. Apa komen you? Apa, how are we to, if we are to equip ourselves and to be ready, how are we to do it together using, probably using my start and ISN and also all the agencies under KBS. Uh, and finally, Doc, how do you feel in VC Sukan Negara tu, kita kena rangkumkan perspektif tu? Macam mana kita nak sampaikan mesej tu? Okay, thank you, uh, Syamil. Right, uh, from um, my perspective, uh, the, the contribution of technology in sports is uh, mainly uh, to increase the performance of an athlete, uh, to prevent injuries. And and uh, another thing is uh, might be to, for for fans uh, engagement. So um, I, I'll be talking on behalf of the academics. So uh, like I said before, uh, the problem uh, uh, in academics is actually not knowing what the actual problem is because we we are not uh, en engage with the actual athletes. So um, this is where uh, the collaboration uh, should. Uh, should take place uh, to to ensure that we we will do research uh, that uh, is is going to solve the problem at hand. Uh, and uh, another thing is that um, when we talk about um, development of uh, sports technology products, I think in any uh, product development phase, one of the things uh, that uh, one of the obstacle is is the funding. And the funding is to to, to do the R and D is one of the most uh, one one of the biggest contributor to the cost of uh, product development. So I think this is where uh, academia or universities can can help the industry because uh, at the university we have uh, several uh, funding in form of grants. So university uh, usually have internal grants. We can also apply grants from the Ministry of Higher Education. And sometimes, like um, Mr. Azmi told just now, we can also get grants from uh, government institutions such as ISN. So um, I think academia can help the industry by performing the R&D. Uh, if not on behalf of industry, uh, we perform the R&D together with the industry. And with the help of the grant, uh, industry can save uh, a little bit of money. Uh, and... Uh, at the university, we have a lot of uh, uh, equipment such as the, the software for simulation. For example, we have, uh, we have machines to, to produce uh, or to, to fabricate the prototype. So I think this is where academia can help. And if we are talking about bigger projects, uh, there is also a, a grant called Matching Grant where university contribute 50% of the, uh, the, of the funding and in industry contributes another 50%. So this is uh, some of the things that we can uh, work together. Uh, I would like to share my experience uh, in uh, sports engineering lab uh, at the University of Padova in Italy. I got the chance to spend a week uh, in Padova uh, working with uh, Professor Nicola Petrone uh, at the University of Padova in, in his lab. Uh, one of the things that they do in the lab is testing products. So companies uh, basically send their products to the lab to be tested. Uh, one of the things that I have seen uh, was the mountaineering helmet. So the, the helmets, were uh, a couple of helmets were sent to the lab 
to be tested for their effectiveness in protecting the head uh, uh, to perform uh, cl climbing, mountaineering, and so on. I've, I've also seen bicycles being tested on vibration uh, test rig. So I think this is a very healthy relationship between industry and academia, and it is an obvious win-win situation. So by having products tested or developed in the lab, this will get more students uh, on top of the lecturers or the, the researchers, students will also get the chance to involve in the development uh, and therefore creating uh, manpowers towards empowering sports tech uh, company in Malaysia in the future. So I think uh, as a summary of what I am uh, trying to say today is that academia can benefit sports uh, technology industry in terms of R&D. Uh, funding. So um, like uh, SME company, uh, probably they don't have enough uh, machines or funding. So this is where universities can help. And by having students working on the projects will create manpower who in the future will be working with sports tech company, or even better, they, they might establish their own companies in the future. So I think this is uh, one of the healthy things that we can uh, project uh, for the next 10 years. So therefore, I would like to invite uh, industries, uh, academia, and also government institutions to be part of MyStar because I think this is where we would like to be. We, we, uh, we uh, aspire ourselves to be the, the, the hub to connect all of these uh, people. Uh, and, uh, if, and I invite you to go to our website to register uh, as part of the member uh, at www.mystar.org.my uh, and we are not a, a profit-making uh, association so we only charge uh, an annual fee of uh, 10 ringgit per year annual fee of 10 ringgit and if you would like to, to register for a lifetime membership there is one-time fee of 250 so that you pay 250 and that's it because uh, and, and uh, another thing is uh, uh, I would like to share also what uh, my star is planning to do as for our activities. So as uh, uh, an association, we are planning to do um, annual conference. So this is where uh, we would like to gather uh, people from different backgrounds, like I mentioned earlier, uh, not only focusing on the involvement of academia alone, like the conventional conference, but also the involvement of sports institutions, related industries, and uh, in fact, we are planning our first uh, inaugural conference, uh, inaugur virtual conference next year around February 2022. Uh, and also, uh, we are also planning on introducing our uh, own journal, uh, academic journal. But uh, again, we uh, would like to welcome the contributions, uh, not only from, uh, from academics, but also from industries. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, we only have, uh, there are only two journals dedicated to the field of sports engineering and technology in the world currently. Uh, the first one is sports engineering. Uh, this is owned by the International Sports Engineering Association, the one I've mentioned earlier. And the other one is Journal of Sports Engineering and Technology. This is published by um, the International uh, Mechanical Engineering uh, Association. So uh, the contribution of papers or research work uh, to this journal that we are going to introduce uh, should not only come from academia, but also from sports institutions and industries. And uh, another activities that we are planning to do is a sports technology exhibition. So you can imagine an exhibition where industries, academia uh, come and, and exhibit their, their products, their research products, their prototypes. This is an event where um, uh, we can promote technologies in sports and therefore increase uh, participation in sports. Uh, I think technology is one of the driving factor to, 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 uh, to increase uh, the participation in sports like uh, the uh, currently we have uh, wearable technologies and suddenly uh, all of a sudden uh, people started to, uh, to jot down uh, their, their activities, their daily uh, activities, how many steps uh, they have taken in a day. So this is uh, the impact of uh, technology uh, in, in sports uh, as well as uh, human lifestyle. That's, that's my uh, opinion. Thank you. That's excellent. That's an excellent perspective into what my star does. Um, everyone listening, uh, all the attendees, uh, please take note uh, on my star, but also be aware that my star is 
um, similar and also collaborating with uh, STAL, which is STAL, Sports Technology Accelerator Lab di bawah ISN uh, under the National Sports Institute. Uh, basically, STAL is uh, is a link, also a link between researchers, technologies uh, to industry and investment. Um, you know, STAL looks to create more companies like ATF, like Lila. Uh, for example, Joseph, if I may use Lila as an example, uh, possibly the journey or rather the cycle that you went through uh, in terms of the years, uh, X number of years uh, needed to kick off Lila as a product and a service in Malaysia and beyond, um, bodies like MyStar and Stahl would be able to accelerate, expedite the process, uh, process and make it more understandable and, and you know, a, a more pleasant experience for the business owners themselves. What, what, what do you think about that, Joseph? Maybe, um, and, and that's not a discredit to their organization. It's just that there is a reality to how long it takes to build a company. Um, and I, of course, programs designed to support startups or new companies in any way, obviously they contribute and, and they accelerate to some degree. But, um, but uh, I wanted to make a comment before I said something on that on just what Doc was talking about from the university side and the grant side and the, and the connection with, with my stuff because I do think it is an important one. And like a lot of areas of Malaysian sports economy, it's still uh, growing, but I actually think it's quite strong here. Um, and now we, we as Leela, we are a research-backed tech company. What a lot of tech people or people that say they do tech do is they do a little bit of internal research, Doc, you know this, or they just piggyback off existing research. Like I'll look at a website and they'll say nine out of 10 people are obese, but the company didn't do that research. They found that online. The difference with our company is we said, because we created, I created something that no one had ever really used before and was new in the industry, we had to study it ourselves. And so we formed, right at the start, we formed a very important partnership with one of the best sports science institutes in the world, Auckland University of Technology, uh, high performance sport New Zealand and they have now been on a five-year partnership with us we've put in about a million ringgit more at least a million ringgit into that research program and that goes directly to AUT now what you mentioned that's really interesting is AUT gets grant money from their government and so it's a really a win-win so every million I put in over there their government was giving them another million and it helps the sports economy in total now that whole university has got several million dollars just from one company like us because of that. Now imagine if 10 companies in Malaysia did that. And as a result, because AUT, the question would be, why didn't we start in Malaysia? One, we needed an internationally recognized high performance institute. And I work here with sports council and universities. Look, I'm not saying there's anything wrong, but we had to go to a world leader. But what happened is we came back Oopsie, University of Malaya, UPM, we've, and UITM, we've done research studies with all these institutes as a result. So we're spinning down that economic dollar into the universities, and it is helping the equation, and we're publishing research. And I, I joke around, no disrespect to ISN, but my company has more published research than National Sports Council in 30 years, and we've got that in five. But we put it, but we, you know, they're, they're also producing athletes right? We needed that stuff done quick. And that's why we got a very cutthroat, high-end research team to produce world-class research. And we've got over 30 published papers on our product. And the other thing about tech, and as anybody knows, even uh, um, Asmir, you guys want, everybody will know who's got a product, whether you created tape or you created your own version or an, on a, on a, a, you know, a new version of it, somebody turns around and asks, oh, can you prove it? You know, how do I know it's better than this? Did you do the research? Even just ankle taping, somebody will ask, oh, well, what's the research on your tape? You know, correct me if I'm wrong. And so it is really, really critical that uh, I think my studs, will, one of the key things I've heard from them today is to help incubate, grow, and create that research connection. Because you're right, companies don't have the money or the manpower to pay for uh, a research team and research equipment. And really facilitating it and understanding it. And I would suggest my stuff, sit down with some of us in the community and learn a little bit more. How does research really impact that? What did you need from us? 
and learn a little bit more about how that works. And the other person that would be interested in this would be Xiong, and that is population data statistics. I was on your website and you know, there's, there's a ton of data that we did at ISN and I think nobody has it. I don't, you know, it's a bunch of projects that happened in early 2000 and I'm wondering if they built on that. And, and you know, we're, when you have difficulty even describing your own market, you know, Malaysia is 10% or 20 or 30% participation. That information's out there. And I, and I certainly think it's the kind of stuff the university can, uh, needs to apply. And, and for us, without that foundation, we would not be here. Paris Saint-Germain, Steph Curry, the All Blacks, you name it. None of those guys would be talking to us if we didn't have that partnership, we didn't have that research, and we weren't science back. So for, in some cases, it's critical data for success. And I, like I said, I applaud my studs working in that direction. And I do think if you're gonna grow real tech, and that means stuff that is foundational, uh, like deep tech, whatever you wanna call it, you're gonna have to do the research in-house. And, and if Malaysia can, uh, can continue to focus on that, it'll really help. Because I think there's just as good programs here but you know, like I said, uh, New Zealand and other countries, it's a it's a little more advanced right now. But I do know that the universities here are ready to do the research. They need that connector. That's just a thought, you know, and because it's one that came up, and I thought it's for our company, it's just so valuable. And I'm sure some of the others might have some input in that area. Beautiful, beautiful. In terms of research and development, um, there is a burgeoning or rather growing sector. Uh, which involves the uh, academic sector. We have institutions like UTHM, as a, some of the ones that uh, Dr. Hasnun mentioned just now, uh, which have a very, uh, uh, they are very uh, influenced or rather they are privy, open to the use of data and research within uh, local commercial uh, applications. So how, uh, okay, we know how you can be connected, but what, what's the level of difference in terms of acceptance of what you do? Okay, so I'm specifically, Joseph, I'm, I'm asking about the level of acceptance in terms of the National Sports Council or rather the peak performance athlete sector. Uh, is it more tech? that you've been, you know, that you're a Malaysian tech or, or just does tech scare the athletes and their management uh, up to today? What would be the, the sentiment that you have come across? And uh, if something is to be improved, what could you share with us how it can be improved? Being, being honest, the tech doesn't scare them. They get it. Malaysia has a pretty tech savvy group. Sports Council is a pretty smart group and I can see the others nodding and they know that. It's funny. I mean, you name it. Name, name an athlete here and they have used our product. I guarantee it. You know, Farhan's trying it. Not trying. She's fine tuning her Olympic program on it right now and her, her specific trainer and I just set up that program. He's doing, you know, they know what they're doing. They had on a even back in the early day, we were back in 2000, we were really looking to bring in good tech. So I think there's a really good history at ISN to engage tech, whether it's an app for, you know, for event development, whether it's something in the rehab area like Esmir is doing, whether it's something in, in management and sports facilities, no problem there. The problem is only really it's around price point. And, you know, for me, and I think that's it, right? And again, you're at dollar parity. Uh, we're a U.S. dollar product. Ours is a very expensive product. I can get a car made in China cheaper than I can get my own suits done just because the, the, the materials are so expensive. And so if there's anything that scares them, it's a product that is designed for an international market, but it's selling here. But that is growing. And everybody knows Kale's salaries are going up. Uh, standard of living is going up. It's getting, it's a better conversation. But to answer your question, we don't see, I don't see any barriers in understanding the tech. You know, it's a they, they, they're, it's the same thing that we would have conversation I would have in New Zealand along with Malaysia, you know, and that's an encouraging thing. And that's a growth, that's a growth indicator. I mean, when I came to Malaysia, I used to go out at five o'clock in the morning fishing out in Ululanga, and I, I would be out there by myself. Now I go out there, there's hundreds of people cycling and running and doing activity. And so it's really encouraging to see that market growing and I think tech fits in there very well it, it'd be interesting to hear what the others say like with virtual runs and uh, you know like rehab it's such a tech driven area you you hit the nail on the head uh, you touched a topic which is very close to our hearts which is the accessibility in terms of value yeah, in terms of uh, the cost 
uh, to market said products and services. So this one I'd like to ask Azmi first before we move to Raymond. May, in terms yes. of creating a better value proposition for your mm. product, share with us a bit on, on how, what was your journey and the more important points of how together with uh, Institute Sukarnagara and uh, STAL and ISN Yaga that you managed mm. to launch new products at locally smart prices. Okay, I think it's all about uh, finding the right uh, manufacturer and sourcing. And then uh, in terms of the cost, as we compare to other international brand at the same quality standard, um, they spend a lot more on branding. So I think that's the cost that, I mean, they incurred quite a lot. So so how we work uh, here is we try to uh, minimal that cost and work with uh, institution uh, to push the product instead. Uh, at the end of the day, um, a lot of product um, and one advantage that we have here is we don't uh, develop a new ready tech, which what uh, did what Joe did. So he spent a lot of money on developing the technology, R and D, and stuff. So what we do is we try to use whatever technology is already in the market and try to improve from there. So the cost of R and D is a bit uh, smaller as compared to when you start from scratch. So that's one way of how we try to maximize. So as Joe has mentioned earlier, price point is very sensitive here in Malaysia because mm -hmm. people could not appreciate uh, ex uh, quality or tech stuff is expensive, but they can still pay for iPhone 11 Pro. I don't know. I but, don't understand. But they understand the tech, but whether they pay for yeah, it or not. I different. understood. I mean, they, they understand the tech, but they don't appreciate the price. They cannot appreciate the, the value that they get for that price they, is, is a mismatch for to a certain mm. extent for most people but those people who are more acceptable or have rather luxury to pay for this kind of stuff uh, they can easily accept the technology at that price point so it's very important for us uh, local brand especially uh, to produce uh, somehow a quality product but at a price point that is uh, manageable and accepted in the local market. So we did a lot of research and understanding on uh, what are the competitors uh, and all the other brands out there uh, selling at. So what we're trying to do is if we can beat the price, but we give the same amount of value or rather a bit lower quality. I mean, not without compromising on the quality, but I mean, we compromise on certain stuff, but overall they will get the experience that they needed then it will be a good match with the price point that we want to sell. So that's how we manage overall on how to get a selling point. But to a certain extent, I agree with Joe. I mean, Malaysians are very sensitive with the price, especially uh, because of uh, currency exchange and that kind of, mm. kind of thing. Yeah. Consumer power has always been a challenge to us. Exactly, exactly. I mean, that's, that's how we, 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 we are less one of our USP, trying to deliver a quality product, but a, a price point that people can uh, accept it and, you know, and use it without any compromise. We commend you. We... Uh, yeah, Joe. Sure. No, I was going to say, and also goes back to the value. Now, back to, because there's that keyword there, value, right? Yep. There's, mm -hmm. when... Because the, the economy is growing in Malaysia, people are spending money. You know, people are buying $10,000 US bicycles, two or three of them, yeah, people yeah. riding on the weekends. You know, <laughs> it's, it's crazy. But I think one of the things also from my uh, and ISN's perspective is I think there should be almost a very quick portal that allows local company, local tech to get a recognition under ISN or MSN quicker and faster. Because one thing that adds value is if you can put that chalk. And if you're a local company, yeah, I, I can see the heads nodding. And I'm yep. just thinking, because ISN and MSN, you know what? Asian countries still trust their government, right? And ISN and, and institutes like this carry a lot of weight. Exactly. And, and so when you have that stamp, oh, you know, people just say, oh, ISN's using it. And I think it's another area my stock can really do justice to help companies like ours, but new companies coming in. Mm -hmm. is if you're a Malaysian company and, you know, a Malaysian company, you know, not just one area of Malaysia, but a Malaysian company, you've developed here, you've done the ABC, there's almost like a, you, you can get some level of recognition from ISN and MSN because that's perceived value. And then your price point conversation becomes easier. Different. Yeah. Yeah. And you guys, you probably agree with me, right? 
-hmm. you know, if you are recognized, if your race series is recognized and supported in, by MSN and KBS, it's a very different conversation. People, people are willing to, you, you don't have to convince people as much and they, they see value. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I would think. Well, well what, a, what a discussion we have on our plates today. It's already 4.15, uh, how time flies. So I'd like to jump into, before we cover the polling, as well as uh, two questions from the Q&A section uh, from Serena, as well as from Eric. I'd like to first ask Raymond, before I go to Cheyong, yeah, I ask Raymond first. Raymond, in terms of local innovation, we all know that everyone has a role to play. Okay. How has AFA and yourself and AFA, your company, prepared yourself in terms of your business cycle as well as the future business cycle that is going to be set upon you in the post-pandemic world? So how are you equipping yourself? Well, um, that's a really good question. So um, what we have in mind is like, I do agree that technology influences how athletes train and compete. Example, what uh, Laila did and also our ATF do. Um, and also it will affect how fan engage and consume content and how world-class venues are constructed. And I believe uh, in Malaysia, we are very blessed with a very strong community of sports fans and sports enthusiasts. And when it comes to the future of sports technology and innovations that lies ahead that we should be anticipating for, just bear in mind that eventually a lot of this... Um, Personally, what I think is the sports facilities and businesses are learning to be more pandemic proof to make it easier for the understanding of uh, the listeners. There are main, two main aspects that personally as an AFA we are exploring today. First is definitely the very least explored, which is the commercial sports hub that houses people that do sports for their leisure. And uh, this inclu includes like people that play sports from grassroots level to amateur at the same time, the facility itself is going to be a place for pros to train and also uh, to play on a regular basis, right? And second is the fan engagement technology. And the stadium tech infrastructure and fans experiences both physically and virtually, like uh, what uh, BIIB did is uh, the virtual experience, the combination of uh, the physical sports and also gamifying it into, into, into something that is, uh, can be virtually done, right? All of this, um, uh, we, we do look into, and I believe um, AFA is uh, shaping ourselves to be, uh, to what I uh, mentioned earlier, basically to make ourselves uh, more versatile in that sense, but at the same time trying to adapt into technology because adaptation is basically really, really inevitable. Yeah. Okay, that's a good answer to a good question. Um, uh, in terms of Okay, this, this question is for Xiong. Eh? Xiong, in terms of, uh, you know, what lies in store for us in technology, in our consumer markets within sports, uh, because you deal with uh, large masses of uh, sports enthusiasts, what do you think are the most uh, apparent trends coming upon us in the next few years for the benefit of everyone? Okay, wow, this is a, a big question. Oh, so before I answer that, uh, I think... We were talking about value. Um, Joe yeah. did, uh, Asmin did that as well. So end of the day, it's all about value. If let's say we can create or even, you know, what is coming up next is always about values that we can provide or even other sports technology companies that can provide to the consumers. So end of the day, there is no specific big trends or things like that. So I will see sports as a, as a combination of multiple pillars you know, you have different products serving different, you know, different pieces of the market. So end of the day, there's no one thing that's going to um, capture the market. But if you can provide the value, you will get the clients. And like what you're just uh, discussing before this, um, we are talking about price point, right? So um, Malaysia-wise, like what Joe did, people actually spend more on sports. We can see that, we can see it happening. Um, Five-figure buy, uh, four-figure watches, all these are happening. And it's actually happening in a very, very large scale. Just that perhaps the sporting communities, they are like different types of people that, you know, perhaps general public didn't really understand. Say, why do you spend five-figure for a bike? You know, I, I bought it from 
you know, cy cycling shop, perhaps a few hundred ringgit. So that kind of thing that really differentiate uh, people who are into the sports and people who are more like general kind of consumers. So as long as we can identify uh, the target audience, uh, identify their needs, the value that we require by them, perhaps anything can become big uh, in terms of acceptance in, in the country. Just, just to touch a bit, yeah, I'm going to ask you another question, Sheyong, which is how are you going to adapt to this post-pandemic? Different people, the different way we are going to consume sports and how you plan to stay ahead of the market. Okay, that's one. But also to touch on what you said just now, in terms of the global value, uh, for example, I was shared this data very recently about the cycling industry and from a value of, I think it has the potential to reach 69 to 70 billion US dollars in the next four to five years. That's an exponential increase of about 800% from what it was in the last decade or so. So this speaks volumes on how trends and cultures are uh, influencing how we consume sports. That's one. But secondly, very importantly, is that we are decentralizing our view to sports, not just from a, from a cultural uh, context, but also the fact that we have to work from home. We have to isolate ourselves. So what, do you have, got to, what have you got to say about that? Anything uh, probably about BIIB and what you're planning to do to be able to harness that? Okay, I think, first of all, social media plays a big role in terms of creating trends. Um, we need people who are workers. We need people who are willing to share what they are doing. So I think we got all these people, you know, people trying to share more on social media, trying to be more engaged. And what they do actually matters, like micro-influencers or even, uh, you know, athletes in national levels, state levels. What they do actually inspire other people to follow suit. So as long as uh, people feel that the item is having or the product or services is having great value to them, they will actually follow. Just, just like what you say about cycling. The, the supply can't even meet the demand before the cycling is being banned in Malaysia due to the lockdown. So that really creates, uh, I would say, big market shift. If you look at 10 years ago, perhaps most of the bicycle shop, they are, they are waiting to close down. But the whole trend actually saved the market. You know, isn't that amazing? I mean, people actually changed the, how, basically changed the whole market, how it works. So if let's say that is happening, we can actually make that happening for any other sports. As long as first, the sports need to be accessible. I mean, they can do it perhaps without facility or if they need facility, we have more facilities for them to use it. Then... I mean, anything can actually grow into the mainstream. Yeah, that is from my point of view. Yes, and uh, I'd also like to add, uh, basically in, in, in sports, uh, and especially focusing on sports technology, it is a very grey area uh, where we have a regulation and also acceptance level. So, for example, I've been asked to point out that uh, there is what we call the shark skin swimsuit which was developed together by Speedo and AIS uh, and also a tech company in Italy. It caused a bit of a stir during the Olympic swimming uh, events because everyone using and adapt adopting the technology were breaking records over and over until FINA, the association, had to ban certain elements of the technologies and change the regulation of swimsuit materials because of this. So that is one example of how the acceptance levels towards sports is uh, you know, is something that is evolving. So that, that, that is something that we'd like to see a better, more positive environment in Malaysia. And uh, we believe that everyone, uh, Dr. Hasnon uh, and Joseph, with all your experience within the peak performance side, uh, not to stop pushing this envelope of new technology uh, to, to increase acceptance and all of that. So if I could also share a bit, I Institute Sikandagara did a small study about research and development uh, exp expenditure of other countries and the success, the correlative success in their sports competitions. It does conclusively show that the more you invest in R&D, the better you perform in sports. Okay, so uh, best example would be F1. So we are aware that that's not the adage or rather saying to, to hold true to for everything but we believe with the right amount of spending not just to spend 
many, many dollars and to throw money at the problem. But however, we understand that for all of you attendees in the room today, uh, feel free to reach out to everyone here and especially to the National Sports Institute and ISN Tech for you to be able to explore together on how ISN, the government, the systems, your fellow uh, peers and uh, colleagues within the industry will be able to collaborate and help you to move further. Okay. Um, I would like to address uh, two more questions within the Q&A section. Uh, if you, everyone could look at the Q&A section. The first question, or rather the third question, I start with the later question first, uh, from Eric Tan. Athletes are not scared of technology. It's a statement, uh, not an answer question. Uh, they're not scared of technology. They embrace it, especially if it helps them in improving their performance. That's very true, Eric. Uh, but also uh, has something to do with your question. Uh, Sarina asked that our adoption rate of technology in Malaysian sports is slow compared to other countries. Why? Could it be because there's a resistance to shifting mindsets and embracing change even at the highest level of the sports ecosystem? How can we level up? Anyone care to comment on Sarina's question? Okay, okay. Let, let me just answer as a part of an ex-national athlete and then Joe can, maybe can, probably can add more as a, involved in a peak performance. I think uh, we have to understand that uh, the nature of how Malaysian government works. So we have to understand in terms of, because uh, this is go bigger than you know, technology adaptation and stuff like that. This go, it is uh, essentially the fundamental is, is the budget that each um, ministry get. So when you have a certain budget, there's a certain limitation that... Uh, uh, ministry can spend on you know technology adaptation and especially Malaysia being a country that we always bring technology into the country so we have to make sure whatever money spent is uh, can be benefited to um, majority of the athletes rather than on a certain individual so that's how I think it's not about not trying to adapt but it's certain of a limitation of probably funding that we don't have to adopt to that kind of technology. I don't know, maybe, Joe, you can, perhaps instant, if I may share. Um, in Malaysia, I think recovery boots have been used widely in all over the world, I think five to seven years now. But I mean, in ISN, uh, for the whole institute, we only have, I think, three or four to cover the whole national athletes. So it's like, you know, you're using like 20 to one ratio kind of equipment, which is, I think, not suitable enough. For example, if you want to use that, uh, um, recovery boots for an athlete going to a certain tournament, then the other athletes that go into another tournament might have to compromise on that technology and they might not get that benefit of uh, recovering faster. So I think companies in Malaysia, I think that's what we are trying to do is to bridge that gap where we can provide a similar technology but uh, at a better price point where we can, so the institute or any association can have more of access to that technology rather than only a certain limitation. Joe, if you want to add maybe from your experience with the MSN back then? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, uh, and I think all those things are correct. Uh, it's a complex question, but I also think um, one thing you said is that there's a lot of resource drain on a place like ISN. Just to Asmir's point, you're right. When you have a centralized system with limited budget and everybody's trying to vie for use of that, it gets difficult. You know, ISN can only afford so much. And that's where the economy needs to come in. And, and there needs to be decentralized training. And there needs to be more partners in the community that are providing support. Because, yeah, you're an international athlete. Like, our, we've now got our kit there at, at ISN. And we have a, a, a partnership with national programs to get discounted rate and education, et cetera but only so much can get to so many people. And if you're on that Olympic profile or Asian Games profile or Sea Games profile or SUPMA, you know, those are tiers and you're prioritized according to that. So it's difficult in a centralized system. And I think it's decentralizing more and more now because you have so many private gyms and places people can go to to get training and education and support and rehab. 20 years ago, there was no sports physios in this country that I would send to outside of ISN. Now, they're on every corner. But on a separate point, I just want to go back to the question, and that's sort of what Esmir was talking about, is that pressure on the resources of ISN. You can't, Australia learned that lesson. UK sport, you learned that lesson. You can't rely on one national institute to provide it all. And so it really means the economy 
and the and the and the marketplace and culture at a whole and partners here like Raymond or Shaon or Asmi or all our different companies really have to be part of this solution outside of that. But we, you know, as a commercial entity, we have to make sure that it's profitable enough to survive and, and be a, a viable company, or else that support won't be there. But the woman who asked the question, the woman who made that very, and by the way, I know Eric Tan very well. That's the, uh, he's the um, CMO senior S&C coach there, high performance coach there at ISN. And he's the guy who said, nobody has a problem here adopting tech. I, I agree with him 100%. Eric and I are good friends and we worked together for many years there. And he knows what he's talking about. But the woman who made the comment, she said, adaptation of tech in Malaysia is slow. Correct? Yes, that's right. Well, first off, sorry, no disrespect to her, but you can't just make a comment without qualifying it. Where's her data on that? I mean, there's no sports system I haven't worked on in this country. There's no organization I haven't been a part of. I haven't seen that data. And I'm not sure who she is. Now, she may or may not be right, but we just had the lead conditioning specialist at ISN say, no, there's no problem to getting tech. We just had Cheong talk about his users buying $10,000 bikes, Raymond's booking facilities for people all over the country. People are using tech here. Tech is dependent on exposure, education, and economy. If you don't get exposed to the tech, you don't know it's there. And with the internet today, everybody knows what tech's available from the newest protein powder to the latest app to find friends for sports to the latest virtual run or whatever. The economy is affecting things because of dollar parity for sure. And then education. And Malaysia, like a lot of countries in the world, people are educated nowadays. People can have conversations about recovery boots. So I don't necessarily agree with the woman that it's slow here. Again, I don't discredit her comment on it, but I still think, and because everybody shook their heads when I said it, it's the dollar and the economy that's slow to make it mainstream across a larger, larger population base. Higher end people are adopting tech like that. You've got people in Malaysia that are buying my suits and they don't even blink. But then you have other people that want to buy it and they, they simply can't, they can't, uh, they can't justify that purchase. So, you know, we work with them, but I, you know, I see those nods. If there's a reason why Malaysia is slow, I think it's more around the dollar parity, the value conversation. It's got nothing to do with knowledge, education, and exposure. I really believe, as Eric said, ISN and all these places, Malaysians are pretty savvy right now in the sports industry. They know what a Garmin and a Cinto can do. They know what an app can do. They know how to get online to find, you know, uh, new friends and communities in the sports community through Raymond and his team. The question is only, are they willing to pay for it? Um, I reckon that um, both, both of you have very valid points. Um, you're right in terms of peak performance, but I, 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 I reckon that Serena's question was centered around uh, the commercial side, the consumerism side, because she herself is a purveyor of a, a very advanced tech, which deals with uh, neural, uh, neural clouds and uh, synapses. So I believe that possibly uh, in her context is the acceptance towards uh, really pioneering uh, technologies, which we believe that is not, um, uh, how to say, is not unique to Malaysia, but rather a problem being faced by all other pioneering technologies around the world. Uh, Sarina, we support your product. We believe that you should keep, you know, keep at it. And uh, no, we believe that there should be an equilibrium of uh, need versus uh, demand uh, in the near future, hopefully. But, yeah? And one thing on that, then that's education. I mean, <laughs> I have the best coaches in the world call me up and say, hey, we saw your stuff. What is it? What is it? So that's an education question. And that's a very costly question. And everybody on this panel has gone through that. Explaining what is my tech? And, you know, if you can't afford to explain it, you can't blame the market for not understanding it. iPhone took them seven years to reach sales numbers that were meaningful. You know, education. It's. So, and I don't think that's necessarily just a Malaysian problem. So like, because the problem is this, if you say Malaysia is slow in adapting tech, then you're creating an excuse. But with what you just described of her company, that tech wouldn't sell in Canada fast either. You know, you would have to do a tremendous amount of education to bring people up on neural cloud pathways. To be honest, I don't even know what that is. Yeah. 
Fadi, so, you know, you know like it's so. My question would be: Do Malaysians are they slow in being educated to new tech? That's a good question. Maybe yes, the panel has a comment. Yeah, uh, it's it's not just about uh, acceptance, but is yes, uh, both ways. It's a two way communication. I agree. And uh, what it does, very important for today's uh, discussion, is that we realize that there is a disconnect uh, between pioneering technologies and how we bring it to the fore. And possibly we could uh, further this discussion uh, and, uh, you know, explore on ways on how to, you know, <laughs> you know how to assist. Uh, my staff. That's his job. <laughs> That's my staff's job. So, Sarina, please uh, reach out to Dr. Hasnon. Dr. Hasnon, uh, we'd, be, we'd love to connect you to Sarina and uh, Teva on this. And um, to touch on one very important point that Joseph and Azme brought up just now, talking about the democratization of sports, yeah, even in the business of sports. Yeah? So, when we understand that we need to give the power. When you spoke about ISN not being able to become the only singular organization, you are correct. You are correct. Because um, we want to democratize sports and also the, the power wielded within the jurisdiction of sports by giving power to sports entities and also subsequently to the industry itself. Because we, we believe that we want to shift that top-bottom approach to a more organic, ground-up approach for this plan. So we want to democratize that process of people growing within the industry, uh, people becoming the retailers and the uh, propagators of any products and services in sports, and also finally the consumers itself. So for the benefit of everyone, I think that this, is, this has been a really stellar session up to now. Um, there has been uh, excellent questions, uh, although not so many from the uh, audiences, but the questions have been on the dot and uh, on point. Um, I'd like to uh, invite the speakers again. Uh, if you have any points or uh, any closing remarks that you have that you'd like to share with us, uh, starting with Dr. Hasnun, um, possibly we could spend the next 10 minutes wrapping up on the session and also uh, you know, looking at how we can extend this discourse into more quality in the future. Okay, um, I think it's just going to be a very brief one from me. So uh, again, um, uh, in, in Malaysia, we have about 20 uh, public universities and a lot more, about 500 or so uh, uh, private universities. So I think uh, it, it's the role of us, my star, to connect uh, universities, um, research institutions with the industries. So uh, again, I would like to welcome everybody uh, to join our association so that uh, we can, if you have uh, projects, uh, for example, related to artificial intelligence, machine learning, for example. So we mm. should be the one knowing who is responsible to do this. So we will connect you. Uh, it is, I think, impossible for you to find uh, these researchers uh, that work in uh, whatever technology that you are going to venture into. So I think it's the role of us to connect uh, with industries and, and uh, academics. So I think um, that's all from me. Thank you for the opportunity. And I, again, welcome all of you, industries, government institutions, uh, academics, to join uh, my star. Thank you. Thanks, Doc. Okay, uh, before we move on, uh, we'd like to run a poll. Uh, it's a, a poll uh, focused specifically on sports technology. Please answer at your own convenience, and then uh, you can share the answers with us. We will publish these answers on all of VSN 2030s. Uh, social media accounts, namely Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, and Clubhouse. Feel, please feel free to follow us for all the latest updates and news on VC Sukanagara 2030. And uh, next, Joseph. So, what do you think? Bro? Uh, what would be your closing remarks on today? And what would be your hopes and aspirations? Share, share with us your visions uh, to all the speakers. My vision, yeah. Um, um, that I thought, I thought the vision was going to last more than two years and 21 years later, my vision is still Malaysia. So um, I, I just think it's encouraging. One, and I think it's going in the right direction. The other area that we didn't talk about, maybe Vision 2030 is considering this. And that is that if you talk sports culture, and that was your very first point, right? You gave six points at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I think your first one was creating a sport culture. Now, I've been around in this game a long time here, probably a lot longer than the, the panel. And I mean, most of you guys were all just young guys when I came out. And 
I, we were talking sports culture in 2000, 2001, two, three, back then with Hishimoto. And so it is growing, but a culture starts in children. You have to remember that. That's why we teach things to children. Because by the time you're adult, you're already wired. Just ask anybody their views on, you know, all the big ones, religion and politics and family and whatever. Your culture is in you early. And so sport culture really has to be something they're teaching in the schools and continuing to engage if you want it to come out in the economy. And I do think that was always the most critical thing that we saw is you said for every dollar you spend in technology, sports economies grow. For every dollar you spend on building a sport culture in the school system, I think you get hundreds, if not thousands back. So that's something to encourage. And I don't know where it fits in on the puzzle. But I just want to say thank you for letting me be in here uh, and part of this. It's been great. And I just want to say to all the business leaders, Raymond, uh, I've already connected my head of sales. He's going to reach out. We want to have a chat with you about how we can work together with you on that store. Uh, Cheyong, awesome. we've, got, we've got some ideas also in the virtual run areas. Running is a big area for us. So we'll reach out with you to try and make some connection happen. And Asmir and I have already been planning to reconnect and look at maybe some bundling and things we could do together. And I think that's the value of having great people is, you know, we know how to connect with each other. And I was looking forward to this opportunity to learn a little more what they're doing. And I think that's what we're good at. So let's stay good at that. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you very much. Yeah. Before we move on to the closings for the other speakers, I'd just like to share a little bit of the findings on the poll. Uh, for question number one, do you agree that Malaysians are open to embracing new technologies? It's an obvious question. And 97% answered yes, thankfully. Oh. <laughs> so question number two, do you use any fitness tracking apps or software? Uh, a resounding 90% answered yes. So that's really heartening to know that the, the age of digitalization in sports is really being embraced by everyone. Okay. And number three, have you purchased or subscribed uh, to any fitness tracking software in the last six months? And the answer is, very surprisingly, it's a 40% yes. So oh, yeah. it shows that, you know, subscription to the fitness tracking software is always the first step to adopting an active lifestyle where you commit to your nutrition, to your mobility, and also other aspects of your wellness. That's very good. Uh, number four. Uh, do you believe that new technologies are easily available and affordable in Malaysia? Uh, this is directly correlative to our discussion today. Uh, the answer is 55% uh, yes and 45% no. So it's cut down right uh, straight down the middle. And we hope that this is an answer that can improve in the next uh, yeah. few sessions that we have. Okay. Um, and finally, is do you agree that Malaysia's infrastructure is capable in supporting an active and digitized sporting industry. So 13% strongly disagrees, 9% disagrees. And uh, a combination of 66% agrees or slightly agrees. So it shows a positivity in the attitude towards Malaysia's readiness in, in, in being a you know, sports hub in the region and beyond. Okay. So for next, we move on to uh, Azmir. So Azmir, any closing remarks uh, before we go on what's your hopes and aspirations and probably your takeaway take points for today? Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the VSN 2030 team for having me today with all the other panels. It has been a very fruitful discussion today. I think at the end of the day, what you have been saying, I mean, uh, it's not like uh, one party, we need everyone to be on board to make sure this happens. Okay? And it, start, it has to start from uh, the grassroots. I think once uh, the grassroots are better understood on all this technology, exposure to sport, and they will be more accepting to all the technology in the future. And we can see that in our kids uh, before this. Uh, I mean, I have my own kids who are now embracing more technology because of the exposure to the mobile phone. So they are ready to accept all this new stuff uh, compared to us. I mean, same like sports. So if we expose, expose them early, then it will be easier for them. And once we got the mass market, the price issue will be solved easily. I think the issue with us today in Malaysia of the price point because we don't have a huge market to cater for the supply. So that 
become making the economy a bit biased and make it costly. So once we are exposed, have better market, and then all the problem, inshallah, will be solved. That's a brilliant point, actually. That's a brilliant point. Thank you for sharing with us, Hazmi. Uh, next, uh, we keep asking Shayong last, so I'm going to even last this time. Shayong, uh, share with us a bit of your visions and aspirations and, and probably some observations that you'd like to share. Okay, sure. Uh, yeah, I think um, sports is uh, is something very unique. Um, you know, it's national, but also global. Um, it's it's kind of universal because running here, the tools that you need and running in some other areas in, in, in the world is basically quite similar apart from the weather, apart from the you know, environmental condition. So I, th- I think it's, it's a collective effort from all stakeholders, uh, not only government, of course, but also commercial and grassroots to actually make a change together. So uh, like uh, the sole one-sided effort will not work because it, it needs to be a balance between consumer uh, supply and the user and the, of course the catalyst of the change. So uh, like what you just said, the price point, um, sometimes some product like uh, Lila is actually perhaps, I think Joe did the right things. If the price point is an issue, go overseas first then come back Malaysia, you know, next. So I think, um, yes, price point is always an issue for Malaysia, but end of the day, if let's say your product, because like I say, sports is something very global, globally connected. If your product works, it can always be somewhere else first. Of course, we like uh, product made in Malaysia, but end of the day, it doesn't matter. As long as end of the day, user can enjoy it and user can actually have a chance to use it here in Malaysia and benefit the sports in in the national level. So I w- for, for the last part, I would like to invite uh, you know, more people to start fixing the answer, of, sorry, fixing the issue. So if you notice any issues in sports, in your tournament, in your perhaps your daily activities, if you notice it, find ways to solve it. So we need to shift minds uh, from a consumer mindset to a so-called creator mindset. So if we can actually make that paradigm shift we can actually create a lot more localized solution can actually go global. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. Um, and we have our last speaker, Raymond. Bro, could you share with us what would be your vision aspiration? If you do have one to plug your company also, please go ahead. And go ahead, bro. So first of all, uh, hold on. Uh, yeah. First of all, uh, thank you very much, uh, VSN 2030, for the opportunity. Um, by the way, Joseph, I'm uh, looking forward to work with you. And um, basically, um, if I were to have the opportunity to speak on a uh, sports uh, infrastructure technology behalf, I believe uh, technology alone can only do so much, right? Uh, we need to work with like uh, collectively private sectors, the developers, technology startups, like what uh, Xiong said, and also the government to come together. And I'm even urging like our local government to open up the community centers like the Day One Sukan, Serbaguna, the Combat Sukan, to work together with the sports tech startup companies uh, to move towards technology adaptation. That way, I believe it will encourage more communities to be involved uh, in sports and occupying these spaces, um, basically a perfect space to house communities and to facilitate the nation's um, interactions and also the engagement through sports with the presence of technology. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Raymond. So that brings us to the end of our session today. Um, on behalf of uh, Secretariat BC Sukanegara 2030, National Sports Station, on behalf of the National Sports Institute, um, we'd like to thank everyone uh, for joining us today. Uh, we'd just like to recap that today was a town hall session uh, discussing on technology and innovations in sports. Um, before we go, we'd like to extend our heartiest thank, thank you, gratitude to Dr. Muhammad Hasnun Arif Hassan, our President of Malaysia Sports Technology Association, Mr. Joseph Dulceti, CEO of Lila Move Tech, Raymond Hung, CEO of Athletes for Athletes, Azmi Z, CEO of ATF Sport Taping, and Sheyong Tan, CEO of BIIB and New Pals. Thank you so much for making the time to come and share with us. To all the attendees, uh, please feel free to uh, visit uh, vsn2030.my or you could email info at vsn2030.my to uh, express your displeasure, distaste or to puji and recommend uh, some a few things. So, uh, guys, uh, 
today we'd like to thank you again uh, this was has been a spectacular session um, all the feedbacks and inputs that you have shared will be uh, collected and collated by the secretariat and uh, we would like to extend our gratitude and to invite you for all our, of our next engagement sessions please feel free to come and share your ideas feedbacks inputs and aspirations again uh, on behalf of the secretariat and the ministry of youth and sports we would like to Thank everyone. Terima kasih banyak-banyak. Take care and kita jaga kita. Stay safe at home. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.